Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So many of you know that I am very fortunate to take part in the Next Generation Leadership Initiative through the United Church Pension Boards, NGLI for short. It's a 10-year program that's designed to help young clergy who are committed to parish ministry stay in parish ministry. And I admit that it seems a bit weird to be fighting clergy burnout with more theological education, but for me it seems to be working. I've been gifted with training in family systems and congregations, as well as transformational and adaptive leadership. And one of the perks of the program is that they take each class to General Synod. I first got to go to General Synod, which is the biannual meeting of the United Church of Christ to, in Cleveland in 2015, and I just recently returned from General Synod in Baltimore. It's where we gather lay and other church folk come, who come together to discern resolutions of witness, and church governance and function. So basically, it's a giant church nerd convention. We also <laughs> gather in daily worship and prayer. And I have to say that over the two times that I've gone, I've gotten to witness some of the finest preaching that I've ever seen in the world. It's a completely wonderful and completely exhausting experience. And it's designed to help those of us who are diehard congregationalists to feel more connected to the wider church. The purpose of both work and worship at Synod is not lost on me. In fact, it was the main focus with our conversations with NGLI and Synod. We had long discussions about function versus form when it comes to the church of the future, raising the questions, what are the timeless functions of the church? And in what forms have they been delivered? These are terribly exciting things to ponder, I am sure. So, so exciting, in fact, that we made a super long list and we wordsmithed it like the annoying seminary graduates that we are, and we came up with a brief 32 talking point list about what is the timeless function of the church. For me, I had to simplify that way down. 32 talking points is not sustainable. You would be bored and you would be angry with me at the end of that, so I'm going to break it down to two things. To me, the timeless function of the church is work and worship. And even though those verbose lists were full of good ideas about the forms that work and worship can take, I'd like to suggest that we can sum up the notion of work and worship even further. To me, the timeless function of the church can be boiled down to one word and one action, love. At Synod, we watched the Reverend Dr. William Barber of the Poor People's Movement say it plainly. The language of the left and the right is too puny. We need a moral language for this time of crisis. And we know, like Reverend Barber knows, that we've already got moral language. It's spelled out for us very plainly in the stories in the Bible. Because love is the Bible summed up in a word. It's the arc of the entire narrative. Love. From start to finish, here it is. It's love, 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 love. The church of the future can only exist if the church of the right now remembers that love is the timeless function of the church. And I think that the message that we get from this week's text is simply that in the midst of a changing world, let's hold on to love however we can. Love is both the strong message in the gospel this week as is in the Deuteronomy passage. In the gospel of Mark, a scribe asked Jesus which commandment is first of all to which Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that seems simple, doesn't it? Just go do that. Go out and love people. Go and build them bicycles. Go and mow their lawn. Go and be a friend, be a neighbor. Job done, that's, that's it. That's all you have to do, right? It seems so easy, but we know that it's not. Listen, the first part of this commandment that we see in both the Deuteronomy passage and in the Mark passage, it's a calling. It's God's calling to you and to me, and that calling is complete. God calls us into love, into a complete love that holds all that we are. Nothing comes before this love. It is our life at its inner core, personal and achingly real. 
But the last part of Christ's answer needs some unpacking. How? How do we possibly love each other enough? There are so many barriers to love. From four-year-old tantrums, to sitting through work meetings, to dealing with people out in the world on a daily basis, to reading or watching the news and seeing all the ways that people are choosing hate over love, to our own health challenges and financial challenges, our fears and our anxieties, all of it. Life can itself be at times a barrier to love. But that doesn't change the fact that we are called to love and we are consistently learning and relearning to recognize and embody love to our neighbors and ourselves. It can be hard because things change so quickly. The self itself is a body in motion. It's a thing in motion. Our children teach us that. My husband John and I notice with small ones in the house that we are constantly responding to change. We sometimes even celebrate it. We try to meet their challenges more or less. We buy them new shoes, it seems like all the time. We hold them close and we allow them to wriggle out of our laps, eager to find their own way of being. And we try to do it all with love. And they show us love and return without even knowing it. Because I'm of the belief that if I saw everything through my children's eyes, I'd be able to see magic in everything. Everything would be a learning experience. Everyone I meet would be a possible friend. I think my attitude would be more positive and I would see the world as full of possibility. I could enjoy the present and not worry too much about the future or dwell too much on the past. My children reminds me that, that this is how God sees us, as beloved and wondrous and as creations that he made. And I realize that my children are privileged to see the world through rose-colored glasses and that their innocence is a privilege. I'm grateful that they have their health and a stable family in which to grow up in. And I know that their childhood does not reflect the norm of people their age across the world. Theirs is a childhood that is full of love, but it's not without its challenges. And John and I think it's extremely important to teach our sons all the ways in which we are privileged and the ways that we are disadvantaged so that they can be better equipped to spot injustice and inequality for themselves and then hopefully try to do something positive about it. And we teach them to give thanks. And they do give thanks in daily prayer to God, just like our Hebrew forebearers taught us. We adults are to be the bearers of truth to the next generation. And so we look at the quote from both Deuteronomy and Mark today and recognize the Hebrew prayer, which is known as the Shema. The Shema was the prayer that was so important to the community that it was to be passed on to the children onto this next generation and to their children's children. And it begins with, hear, O Israel. That is a sure sign to listen up and pay attention because what was about to come, you don't want to miss. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God is one. That's a constant reminder that the community of people were praying to God and to God alone, one God, faithful, consistent, not divided. And although mysterious and often hidden, that is our God. The Shema was spoken aloud while the rest of the prayer was traditionally said in silence amidst the community. And it was so important to the Hebrew people that it was prayed twice a day. And the part that continues and was often said silently is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. But I think that that's not a prayer to be prayed half-heartedly. I say that's a prayer that we need to say out loud because it called the community not only to a personal, intimate, and trusting relationship, it's also a covenantal relationship with God and with each other. And it required a total commitment, a loving with our whole being, with our mind, our body, and our spirit. A love that would move people to act as well as to feel it's a love all-encompassing, and it's work and it's worship combined. Other versions of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament say simply, the commandment is, you shall love. It seems that this prayer is stating the obvious, and it is, yet there are many times in my own journey of faith when being called to love, and I mean genuinely love, I feel rather clueless about how to do it. Perhaps this is because I cannot get there on my own. I can bury myself in theological education, or I can try staying up in my head, but what I 
know about love, I've learned from you. I've learned from my parents and my grandparents and my beloved community. I've learned it from my children and my spouse and my friends. But what I'm reminded is that God sends other people from the community to you and to me to remind us not only that we are loved, but that we are called out of ourselves to love. The late Trappist monk Thomas Merton wrote, for to love you have to climb out of the cradle where everything is getting and grow up to the maturity of giving without concern for getting anything special in return. You see, love is not about making a deal. It's a sacrifice. Love is not something that is packaged to be marketed. It's a form of worship. The people in the book of Deuteronomy amidst their hardships and everyday struggles understood this, yet putting into practice was a lot more complex. Merton later wrote that love is the revelation of our deepest personal meaning, value, and identity. This revelation remains impossible as long as we are the prisoner of our own egoism. I cannot find myself in myself, but only in another. My true meaning and worth are shown to me not in the estimate of myself, but in the eyes of one who loves me. And that is one love that must love me as I am, flaws and all, with my faults and limitations, revealing to me the truth of those faults and limitations. And even knowing that cannot destroy my worth in those eyes, and that I am therefore a valuable person in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my imperfections, and my exterior marketable package. Merton, Merton goes on to say that this package is totally unimportant. What matters is the infinitely precious, precious, precious message, <laughs> flaws, which I can discover only in my love for another person. This message, this secret, is not fully revealed to me unless at the same time I am able to see and understand the mysterious and unique worth of the ones that I love. Hear, O Israel, a prayer of the community calling forth not only to love God and to keep God's words in its heart is also an action beyond an intellectual level, for it's all that is required. And the community of faith was to recite and talk about all of these heady, hard things with children. You see, I believe that it's vitally important that we impress these words and these prayers upon our children's hearts. Our children and our young people are to remember the past and to bring the past afresh into the present, creating a memory that generations will follow. And the memories that I'd like to impress upon them are the memories of past loves and future loves that were coming. And along with our children loving with their whole being and passing on their experiences to their children and their children's children, the community was to so love God that they were to bind the words of God on their hands and on their hearts and on their foreheads as a symbol, a symbol of God's faithfulness. I'm not sure if anybody's ever been to a bar bat mitzvah, but very often during the ceremony, a young person is given telephene. And telephene literally are boxes that hold scripture. This is a toy. It's decommissioned, so it's not legit. But they bind scripture onto their bodies during this. I think that is so beautiful. They bind scripture onto their head and onto their arms, and they place it above a vein that goes directly to the heart because they believe that if you put scripture that close to you, it can't help but be a part of you. And I think that that's so beautiful. And that's exactly what the prayer is telling us to do, to bind that to our children and leave it to our children and leave it to our children's children. Because there's things from the past that need to be brought new into the present. And we need to have those memories. And we need to have those memories so that we can create hope for generations to come. Because we're called to remember. And we are called to teach our children about love. And we know that love can require space. Because if we set rigid limits, we leave bits of scripture out. And we fail to see what is happening right in front of our eyes. Also, if we treat our children as behavioral problems to solve rather than as fellow pilgrims to cherish, we are <laughs> counting them out. 
To truly love ourselves and others, we need to make space for change to happen, and we need to let this love story, God's love story, unfold. But more than that, we need to translate that to the wider church and to the world. And change is hard in a church. It's hard, and it takes time. So we need to lean on the wisdom of the wider church body to join together and make change happen. Which is why I was so excited to learn about the Three Great Loves Initiative that was introduced at this past General Synod. It's an aspirational challenge to our other 5,200 local faith communities in the United Church of Christ. It is both formed and informed in full recognition that no one person, no standalone church, and no single denomination can do all the loving that the world requires. And it's a reflection of what we are trained as next generation leaders. It is simple and it is focused, that we can't be all things to all people. We need to have partners. We need to have help. Our president and general minister, John Dorhauer, now beginning his third year at the helm of something like a million members of the United Church of Christ, is soliciting all congregations' help with three priorities for our consideration going forward. It's an invitation, it's a challenge, and it's calling us to say, can we and will we consider the three great loves that we are being called to lay out? And they are simply these. How do we as a congregation and as a denomination share our love of children? How do we as a congregation and a denomination share our love of neighbor? And how do we as a denomination and a congregation share our love for creation? Love is at the epicenter of it all. It is the very heartbeat of an incarnate faith. And love, again, in the words of Thomas Merton, is the deepest creative power in human life. It's transcendent before anything. It becomes a felt lived experience when we receive it and we put ourselves to the serious work of spreading it. So I'd like to invite us as we remember as we come into our homecoming year that a love of children is a seedbed and hope for tomorrow. And our care for others, and others means not just those who look like us, but more importantly, perhaps those quite different from ourselves, is also a seedbed. And care for this earth, this planet of ours, our only address, our only hope, without which all life as we know it ceases to exist, is paramount for our churches going forward. The church of the future is to be based on love. The epistle from 1 John wraps this up in poetry and scripture and says, love is from God and God is love. And then if we were to add a little fuel to the fire, it says in this sequential affirmation, the core to Christian faith no matter how you interpret it is, we love because God first loved us. And honestly, to come and to live and to share and be recipients and generators of the power of love will take more than yours or my lifetime to accomplish. Love for children is so simple that it's really quite hard. And love for neighbor is harder maybe, but it is also simple and timely as it cannot be just within the sphere of faith but also in our socio and political conundrum in which we live. We pray for peace earnestly in these days, and we have to lift up a love of creation, because after all, God so loved the world and loved us that he invested huge amounts of time and energy and love and love that was born to look like advocacy and care and compassion for this earth, the only home we will ever know. So that's my message for our community today. Because Jesus is telling us directly that love is the total reason for our being. It's the sole purpose for all creation and our own unique place in it. Love defines us. It must be who we are and what we do. We're not just taking space and wasting time. We need to be out there to do the job that God has called us to do, which is to love God and love neighbor. And together, I think we can do it. It's God's greatest commandment. It's not just a suggestion. Amen.